welcome uh, everyone to Bite Medicine's National Medical Competition. I think this is the second one that we have run. Um, it is, you know, it's a pleasure to see so many of you here today. Um, like Troy said, despite the wonderful weather in, in London and around the UK. For those of you who don't know us, my name's Azim, one of the co-founders of Bite Medicine, and this is Shweb. Hello. Um, we haven't done a joint webinar in months and months, it feels like. So it's, yeah, uh, it feels really good to do one, actually. Yeah, it does. It's, it's, uh, it's lovely. And um, obviously, you have the chance to win some great, great prizes today. Um, I'll, tell, I'll give you a rundown on how this is going to work. I know it says 40 SBAs here, and there's actually going to be 30 SBAs. So we'll probably run for uh, hopefully under an hour with numerous prizes available. Um, and I'll touch on those in just a moment. So this quiz, I know it's called the National Medical Competition. It's basically going to include both medicine and surgery, mainly taken from content that was covered in previous webinars, but also content that's in our textbook as well. Um, our textbook and question bank updated very, very regularly. So do check them both out if you haven't had a chance already. Um, so really, this is targeted at medical students in your clinical years and PAs. It's based the questions are based on NICE guidelines, which are UK guidelines. So if you are international, that's just something to bear in mind as well. You have 45 seconds per question. So this is the nitty gritty part of it. As we said, 30 questions, 45 seconds per question. For, you know, the first 27 questions, so the vast majority, it's just about reading the question carefully and you get points if you get the question right. The final three questions are the real discriminators, which are basically the faster you answer, the more points you will receive. But that's only the last three questions. So don't worry about you know, answering really, really quickly for the first 27, only the last three does timing really matter. But for each question, you have 45 seconds max. Um, as we said, medical and surgical specialties, we're gonna give you a brief explanation after each question this will be recorded, so you'll have, you know, the slides, explanations, etc., all available on our website. If you do have any issues, you can click the Zoom link below. Um, in terms of a bit more about prizes, etc., well, first prize is going to be £100, lifetime premium access, national prize certificate, and a mug. What more could you want? You know, absolutely phenomenal prizes. Uh, second prize is a little bit of cash as well, certificate and a mug, and third prize is £25 and a mug as well. But for you to get these prizes, there are a few things you need to make sure that you do. Um, so if you are ranked in the top three, i.e. you are eligible for one of these prizes, um, there are a few steps to take. But one thing that everyone needs to do is make sure that you register on Mentimeter with your full name. This is the software that we're going to be using for this competition. So make sure you register with your full name. If you are placed in the top three, screenshot or take a picture of the leaderboard that's displayed at the end of the quiz, and that will appear on your phone or whatever piece of, uh, whether you're using your phone or your laptop, etc. cetera. So take a picture or a screenshot of that. Um, and then email us after the webinar with a picture and then we will confirm your position as well because we have the tally in addition. If you don't follow those instructions, then unfortunately you won't be able to claim your prize. So really only two instructions, which are register with your full name. And if you're in the top three, take a screenshot or picture of the leaderboard. Um, I'm gonna look at the Q&A now. So let me take a look. So uh, my final's coming up, don't see motivated to study. Fine, we can talk about that at the end. You like my shave, thank you very much. Um, your slides and video show side by side on the Zoom, but I prefer the previous way when your video was along the top and the slide below. I think you just need to, if you click the Zoom link, you can switch to speaker view as well. And you can. Yeah, I think if you just double click on the slides or one of the panels that you want to see, it should expand it as far as I know. Cool. I'm just wondering if these questions are final year level. Yeah, so it's final year level is, uh, is really essentially what these questions will be. Um, can we not enter Menti with our name? Yeah, so we, we won't reveal the leaderboard to everyone. The leaderboard will be shown, only the top 10 are shown on people's phones, etc. So um, the only way we can confirm 
your position is if you unfortunately sign up with your full name. So uh, that, that's just how this quiz, these competitions have worked in the past. So hopefully you, you're, you're okay to do that, but yeah. Only oh, so it, exactly. Really. It's just the top 10. If you, if you come absolute bottom last, no one's ever going to know. So don't worry. Bottom. Ultimately, this is, it's just a bit of fun. You know, exactly. Nothing to lose. If, if you, if you come in the top three, great. If not, it's just, uh, you know, at least you've learned something. Exactly. Nothing to lose, everything to gain. Um, nice. So before I go over to Menti, just a brief, you know, reminder about our question bank, multi-step SBAs, do check them out based on the most recent guidelines. Uh, a great question bank, along with our online textbook, also based on UK guidelines and updated very regularly. Um, so do check those out when you have a chance. So before we launch into question one, let me make sure everyone can sign up for the quiz itself. So hopefully you can see Menti there. So if you head over to menti.com. Um, we can't see Menti, Azim. I think you need to. Oh, uh, what about now? Yep. Yep, Brill. Okay, head over to menti.com. Pop the code in at the top there, which is 29205084. Remember to sign up with your full name. And I'll wait for everyone to arrive. So I think there are, yeah, so I'll wait for a few more. Give you a couple of moments. Thank you, Maruf. Yep, 292054. Anyone else wanting to join? Give you another 10 seconds or so. Hopefully you've got enough time. So for those asking to use phones, computers, you can use whatever you want, really. But if I would advise if you're watching the webinar on your computer, it's probably easier to use your phone to answer the questions so you're not having to switch tabs continuously. But again, it's, it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Cool. I think that still a couple of people, I think, that, yeah, we can, we'll make a start. Let, let's dive in if everyone is ready. Um, okay, so we're gonna start with question number one. All correct answers give you maximum points. So I won't read them through just because it does distract some people, but that's the question and that is the image. Okay, time's up. Nice. So hopefully a nice straightforward question to start us off with the vast majority of the correct answer, which is nasogastric tube. So hopefully you can all see my slides now. I can explain that to you in a little bit more detail. So the story was this 55 year old presented with abdominal pain and vomiting, abdominal x-ray, um, which demonstrates small bowel obstruction, previous open appendicectomy, which also adds to the history. And if we all remember, most common cause of small bowel obstruction is post-operative adhesions. Your priority initially is gonna be drip and suck, what we call it, so IV fluids, patients vomiting, so you're gonna to need to pop in an NG tube, try and decompress the abdomen. Um, and that is why NG tube is your initial priority. So hopefully that makes sense to everyone. And as we said, the slides will all be available uh, for more information as well afterwards. So that's question one. Well done. Let's head over to question number two.
Okay. Good. Wonderful. You guys are smashing it. So another majority answer there of jaundice, which is the correct answer. In cholecystitis, you would not expect jaundice. Jaundice suggests a complication um, of gallstone. So for example, the gallstone might migrate to your common bile duct and result in obstructive jaundice. It may result in ascending cholangitis. So in pure cholecystitis, jaundice would not be expected. All these other features um, are associated with cholecystitis and can occur. The only one here that would not be expected is jaundice. So well done. Fab, question number three. We are rattling through these. Oh, a bit more of a split there. It's kind of what I was expecting. A split between primary biliary cholangitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis. If you found this question tricky, do check back to our couple of webinars on PBC and PSC, which hopefully will clarify things a little bit more. But we have a 42 year old kind of middle aged male with elevated ALP and bilirubin. The most likely cause here is PSC because, you know, epidemiologically, excuse me, most commonly seen in males with these cholestatic bloods, um, pruritus and fatigue, I should say. Um, PBC can present very similarly, but in terms of demographics, PBC is much, much more common in middle-aged females, whereas PSC is usually males, often with, you know, for example, a history of ulcerative colitis. So it's important to think about your, uh, your epidemiology as well. And Naomi's written there, it's, it's remember, I remember it as PBC, B for breast, more common in women, S for sperm, more common in when, men. Nice one, I like that. So PBC, breast for women, S, sperm for men. Lovely, thank you Naomi for that. So not just a competition, but hopefully you're learning stuff as well. Um, question number four. Okay, good. Another majority there of the correct answer, bisoprolol, absolutely spot on, well done. Um, let me just explain that to anyone who had difficulties with that question. So we've got a patient who's presented with a three day history of palpitation. So the key cutoff here to remember is 48 hours. An ECG is performed, which showed a atrial fibrillation, which hopefully uh, you managed to recognize. OBS are stable, but a heart rate of 130. So we've got what we call fast AF or atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response, no past medical history. In these patients, generally, because the duration is above 48 hours, we would offer rate control with bisoprolol. And the other options are incorrect for the reasons described here. 
And once again, if you're unsure, do check back at our uh, atrial fibrillation webinar. This is all according to NICE guidelines, so well done to the majority of you there. Okay, number Three, two, one. Hmm, a tricky one, a tricky one here. Um, so this is based on a combination of kind of NICE guidelines and European uh, urological guidelines as well. Um, we tried not to give options which were too similar because obviously there are different schools of thought sometimes in some of these patients. So the quest, the options were quite distinct. So we've got a 28 year old male who's presented with right-sided loin to groin pain, CTKUB, so a 25 millimeter stone in the renal pelvis, odds and bloods are stable. So if we look here, so we've got a renal pelvic stone, so a kidney stone, 25 millimeter, so a really big one, generally going to be managed with a procedure called percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Um, and the other, we didn't put URS because some patients, you know, some, some surgeons do use that kind of first line. Um, but for the reasons described here, you know, if you think back at the option you put, you'll see that it probably fits in somewhere else. For example, medical expulsive therapy is going to be relatively smallish urotheric stones. L uh, lithotripsy uh, have, have other indications as well. So a little bit of an explanation there for you. So question number six. Okay, time is up. Good, well done. Once again, the vast majority of you getting that absolutely spot on. So remember, so important for clinical practice, remember to learn how we categorize asthma exacerbations. Are they severe, life-threatening, near-fatal? Um, so here the question was, which suggests a life-threatening exacerbation? And the answer here, SPO2 below 92%. Some of the option, other options, I think all of the other options were uh, severe rather than life-threatening exacerbations. So well done once again to, to the majority of you. Okay, number seven.
Arms up. Good. Hypercalcemia. Ah, some of you fell for the old scorpion sting trap. Um, try. <laughs> It's a it's a classic med school, you know. I've got the, the you know the classic I get smashed algorithm here uh, for you for you to remember. So, still uh, the majority of you said hypercalcemia, which would be absolutely correct. Some of the other options include MRCP, so that's that's obviously a non-invasive, essentially similar to MRI scan. Um, so that you know it's ERCP, not MRCP, that can cause pancreatitis, which is the condition in this case. Um, if you're going to say scorpion sting, I recommend not putting that on your differential list. It's obviously very rare, and but if you want to learn the scorpion, then you know one of them is Titus trinatus scorpion bite. Um, but yes, the the correct option here was, uh, was hypercalcemia. Potassium valproate is not a drug. Sodium valproate, on the other hand, can cause pancreatitis. Good question. Number eight. Time is up. Ramapril is correct. Well done. 71% of you, so that's fantastic. So 62-year-old females presented with worsening exertional breathlessness. Hopefully you got from here the raised BMP, uh, BMP or NT pro BNP and the reduced ejection fraction. Obviously, you most of you have managed to get this, but this is heart failure. We're going to start a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor essentially in all patients, unless contraindicated with heart failure. You start one medication and then you start the other. Um, so those are the two big ones to remember, ramipril and bisoprolol. Um, and then the other ones here are, uh, are incorrect for the reasons described. Um, good. Well done. As I said, we you'll have access to the uh, the explanations the slides. Okay, good. Wow. Vast majority of you smashed that one. Klebsiella indeed. So we've got a 42 year old male, history of alcohol excess, fever, cough, red sputum. We're thinking probable aspiration pneumonia and a big one to remember is Klebsiella. So when you aspirate, you often, if you remember your basic anatomy, most commonly, you know, that ends up in your right lower lobe due to how steep that bronchus is. Um, and normally presents with red current jelly sputum, which was what we described here. Um, and it's also associated with upper lobe abscesses um, and often commonly seen in patients with, who, with alcohol excess, diabetics, but also those with underlying neurological problems resulting in dysphagia or swallow. So um, good, you both, almost all of you said Klebsiella. Fantastic. Question number 10.
Okay. So a few queries in the chat there. Could you give us a few seconds to register in between questions? I'll give five seconds here. I think you should have been able to register as soon as you started the quiz, but I'll give everyone a breather anyway at this point, 10 seconds to, uh, to have a bit of a rest. All right, so let's crack on then. Okay, let's have a look. Good, good. So a little bit more controversial this one, but still 58 of you said intramedullary nail, which would be correct. And what you really need to know is your basic algorithm for managing NOFs or neck or femur fractures. 78 year old male, she is no past medical history, usually independent, subtrochanteric fracture. So subtrochanteric is an example of an extracapsular fracture. Um, and often managed with a, with internal fixation with the intramedullary nail. So this is the part of the flow chart you would have gone down. Do check back at our neck or femur fracture webinar um, for further information, or hip fracture webinar. I think it's actually categorised under. And um, we'll go into we go into more detail on this algorithm. But well done uh, to those of you that said intramedullary nail. Number eleven. Okay, let's go. Five seconds remaining. Mm. Nice. I think this is very similar to a question we gave in one of our webinars before. So a little bit of space repetition for you. Um, but yeah, that's correct. 62 of you. Um, so we've got a 61 year old male history of COPD presents with shortness of breath and chest pain chest x-ray shows a four centimeter pneumothorax. So we've got history COPD, i.e. underlying lung disease. So we go down this part of the pathway. This is then defined as what we know, call a secondary pneumothorax. Um, we've then, you know, the patient is both breathless and the pneumothorax is above two centimeters. So the patient will almost certainly need a chest drain. Um, and the sizes that mentioned in the previous question refers to the size of the chest drain. So we don't want one that is absolutely massive. We generally go somewhere between eight to 14 French as per the British Thoracic Society guidelines. So that is why that option was correct. Hopefully that makes sense. Once again, we do have a pneumothorax webinar that you could watch. In your if you just pause, uh, so if you go to the next step, uh, question, but don't actually start it just to give people who haven't entered their name a chance to put it in yeah so if you haven't if you haven't put your name in, you should be able to enter it now so we'll give you like 10 seconds to do that and then azim will start the question
Anyone else looking to join? I think. I think that should be fine. Yeah. All right. Let's crack on to number question number 12. Okay, good. Smashed it. Surgical exploration. Hopefully you all got from the history here that it's most likely testicular torsion, which is of course a surgical emergency. As per NICE, if your history and examination are strongly suspicious of torsion, testicular torsion, don't delay by doing investiga unnecessary investigations because you're just prolonging ischemic time. If this patient had a positive urine dip, it's not going to really affect your management. Um, so, you know, surgical exploration here would be the most uh, viable option. Okay. Question number 13. Okay, good. So this is looking back to some of your kind of basic examination technique and knowing what kind of eponymous signs you would expect on examination of certain patients. So this patient, as I'm sure you got from the history, has likely infective endocarditis. So the two most relevant options here would be Janeway lesions and Osler's nodes. Um, the lesions described here would be characteristic of Osler's nodes, whereas Janeway lesions are also associated with infective endocarditis, but are painless plaques usually found on the palms. Um, splinter hemorrhage also would be a, a reasonable option because that's also associated with event infective endocarditis, but this is seen as the lines, red plum lines under the nails, um, and Hebidens and Bouchards are to do with osteoarthritis. As Andrew said, if you want to remember the fact that Osler's causes painful nodules, then O for ouch might help you. So thank you, Andrew. Okay, so question number 14, we're coming up to the halfway point.
time is up. Good. Lateral circumflex. And I will explain that to you for anyone who had difficulty. So we've got ST elevation in lead one, V5 to V6 and AVL. So leads one, V5 to V6 and AVL. So V5, V6, AVL, one, suggestive of lateral territory is being affected. So the most um, accurate option here would be left or lateral circumflex arteries. Good. Question number 15. So this is the halfway point now. We'll have a, a little bit of a breather after this question uh, for a minute or so, just so you can catch your breath. Um, but yeah, let's do question 15. All right, so a lot of you have been reading your nice 2020 guidelines on pulmonary emboli, uh, evidently. So well done. Rivaroxaban, which is a, a DOAC, is the correct option. So Rivaroxaban is now, you know, NICE have, have uh, really leaned towards using DOACs a lot more in their NICE 2020 guidelines. So patients with or without cancer, uh, assuming they have normal renal function, are usually offered DOAC as first line. Previously, um, patients with malignancy prior to these guidelines were usually offered uh, low molecular weight heparin as first line. But that, as I said, that has now changed. So uh, this would make Rivaroxaban the most accurate option in this post and patient with underlying malignancy um, and, um, and a pulmonary embolus with normal renal function. So we have our updated textbook looking at all of our, all of our nice guidelines um, updated on um, pulmonary emboli. So do take a look at them. But we are halfway, we'll give you a, maybe a minute break to, uh, to catch your breath, and then uh, I will uh, hand over to Schwabe, who will be covering the last 15 questions. Um, AZ has asked, what about interim in anticoagulation? So as far as I know, we still can use rivaroxaban and DOAX for interim for anticoagulation. Uh, it depends on your trust, but um, yeah, um, I know some trusts definitely still use DOAX. Yeah, so at my trust, we still use DOAX for, for interim coagulation. Yeah, I think there's just a big shift now towards away from warfarin and hep heparin, etc., towards DOAX. Cool. So maybe another 30 seconds and then. Uh... Yeah, so we, we actually have an updated webinar on VTE, etc. So do check that out. That has all the updated guidelines. Shall we crack on? All right, over to Schwab now, and I will, uh, if you're all ready, and crack on with question 16.
Okay, a pretty straightforward one. I mean, uh, so I've written the last 15 questions and um, this is probably one of the, the slightly more straightforward ones. So it's essentially what it's asking, what is the management of a STEMI? Okay, it doesn't matter when PCI is available or not. The first thing you always do in ACS is you give aspirin. Um, once you've given aspirin, you can decide what to do next based on when PCI is available. Um, here, although PCI is available within two hours, the patient's chest pain started more than 12 hours ago. So regardless, PCI would not be an option. But putting that to a side, the take home point of this question is if a patient comes in with acute coronary syndrome, the first thing you do is you give high dose aspirin. Okay, and this is the flow chart with the updated guidelines. Nice updated their guidance in 2020. Um, and essentially the key point is give aspirin, think about what to do after that later. But if you give that aspirin early, that can potentially you know, improve outcomes. Do check out my ACS webinar that I had uh, just over a week ago. Okay, next question. Neuro questions incoming, don't worry. Uh, you asked for neuro, here's neuro. Okay, another fairly straightforward. Well, I mean, I mean, nothing is straightforward because you know, if you don't know it, you don't know it. But um, if intranuclear ophthalmoplegia is something we've seen multiple sclerosis, and if you've learnt that, then you'll know that the thing that's demyelinated in um, intranuclear ophthalmoplegia is the medial longitudinal fasciculus, and that's the thing that controls conjugate gaze. Okay, so when you look to the left, both eyes look to the left, i.e. one abducts and one adducts. And when you look to the right, both eyes look to the right. When that pathway is damaged, that's known as an internuclear ophthalmoplegia, i.e. let's say you're looking to the right, uh, the right eye will look to the right, but the left eye will continue looking forwards. So you get disruption in conjugate gaze, and the pathway that's affected here is the medial longitudinal fasciculus, and it's highly suggestive of multiple sclerosis. That's the take home point from this question. So if we move on to the next one. Um, so Cecilia has asked for more sort of specialist questions and there are a few PEDS questions coming up, um, but we can definitely look into doing a sort of subspecialty quiz. Okay, good. So we're still going strong. Um, I'm impressed. Basically, you need to think about what the diagnosis is here. A, a young man presenting with right severe pain around the eye, lacrimation, nasal symptoms. This is a cluster headache. Cluster headaches are roughly four times more common in men, hence the 20-year-old um, male. Uh, and the way you treat them 
is with high flow oxygen acutely and with intranasal or subcutaneous tryptans, so not intravenous tryptans. Verapamil is used as prophylaxis, low flow nasal cannula oxygen is not used, and bisoprolol, that's not used in um, cluster headache management. You can use beta blockers for migraine prophylaxis, but it's not really used in cluster headaches. Okay, next question. Okay, see, my questions are still too easy. Don't worry, they'll get harder. The, the idea is it's a young lady presenting with anemia. A young lady presenting with anemia is likely losing blood from menstrual losses. Menstrual blood loss will lead to iron deficiency and give a microcytic anemia. If you're looking for iron deficiency, nice advice. The first thing that you should measure is ferritin. Serum iron is not particularly reliable because it can change due to variation and the way it's measured between labs can give you very different results. So the most reliable measurement of iron deficiency is ferritin and that's your first line measurement. Often you'll go to the GP um, and they, they won't even check serum iron, they will just check ferritin to look for iron deficiency anemia. Good. Do check out my webinar on hematological malignancies and it covers all of this stuff. Um, Again, the diagnosis here is AML, acute myeloid leukemia. The giveaway is the gums, okay? First of all, AML is the most common acute leukemia in adults. So that's, that's um, a big giveaway. And secondly, it, presents, it can present with gum infiltration. So the leukemia cells actually infiltrate the gums and cause gum thickening, also known as gingival hyperplasia. Um, all the other options there don't typically give those gum findings. So that's the key giveaway in that question. Okay, let's move on to the next one.
this is um, something not to be missed. Yeah, good. So it's pneumoperitoneum. There's air under the diaphragm that suggests a perforated viscous or essentially bowel perforation. Um, if you miss this as a junior doctor, as a PA, as a radiologist, or you know wherever you may be working in the hospital, the consequence of that could potentially be fatal for your patient. Um, so it's important whenever you're looking at a chest X-ray, one of the review areas is always under the diaphragm. Check for free air. Um, and that's the key take home point of this question. Priya said, I'm waiting for Shweb to say interesting. Well, sadly, you're all getting all my questions um, completely right. So hopefully they do get a bit harder. Okay, good. Diagnosis here, six month old presenting with cold-like symptoms and respiratory distress is bronchiolitis. By far the most common causative organism is respiratory syncytial virus. Um, you'll see this extremely commonly in GP, in pediatrics, in A&E, so it's a condition to become very familiar with, which is why I've included it in this um, quiz. Good. So this patient has croup, barking cough with stridor. And the confusing thing here can be, oh, the patient has stridor, they have upper airway obstruction, we need to worry. Well, in croup, if the patient has stridor only on exertion, then you don't need to worry. You just give them steroids and send them home. The steroids will clear up the inflammation in the upper airway and they'll get, they'll get better fine. What you need to worry is if they've got moderate or severe disease. So if they've got stridor at rest, that is a big red flag. If they've got respiratory distress, again, that's a red flag. Or if they've got any deterioration in their consciousness. So if the child's floppy, not responding, very agitated, you know, not really responding to feeding, then these are all concerning features. But in this case, the child just had a barking cough and some stridor on exertion. That's not worrying, you can send the patient home with steroids. There is a lecture on pediatric emergencies, which covers all of croup, bronchiolitis, etc. All of these questions are taken from previous um, webinar topics that we've covered.
see some questions coming in. Does the bite medicine textbook have a separate section on peed? Yes, it does. Okay, good. I for intermediate. Humulin I think. I, I, I don't know why I always really struggle with this at med school, but basically if it begins with an L as a rule of thumb, it's long acting. So Levomir, Lantus are long acting. Humulin S, S for short acting. Humulin I, I for intermediate acting. And Humor Log and Nova Rapid are rapid acting. Um, and Act Rapid, I believe is short acting. So there's long acting, intermediate acting, short acting and rapid acting, and you need to know all of the different types and how they work. Um, just as another tip, when you're prescribing on the wards, you always prescribe by brand name. So you always write the name Lantus or Levomir, et cetera. You don't write the biological name. Um, let's move on to the next question. Someone's asked if croup patient has concerning features, what's the management? Um, then you admit the patient, give them nebulized steroids, nebulized adrenaline, they may need intubation. Just depends how unwell they are. Um, Jerry's raised a really interesting point, actually, um, and you know that the the worst person should also get a lifetime subscription. I, I like that idea, and that's something for us to consider. Thank you for raising that. Um, good, interesting. Finally, a hard question. So, um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis is essentially a chronic inflammatory state of the thyroid gland, where patients then get hypothyroidism. Chronic inflammation within the thyroid gland can, over time, lead to a non-Hodgkin lymphoma called marginal zone lymphoma, okay? Um, so if a patient has Hashimoto's and they end up developing a lymphoma in the thyroid, then there's a good chance it may be a marginal zone lymphoma. Good, let's move on to the next question. So final four questions. Good aspirin. So the patient has AF, but you don't anticoagulate them until two weeks after the stroke. So the patient has a stroke, you always treat with an antiplatelet essentially. Um, and then obviously you can take them for thrombolysis, et cetera, if, they're, if that's applicable, but here it's not applicable. Um, so this is the flow chart for stroke management, which is in our textbook. So please do check that out. But basically if their symptoms are after four and a half hours, you give aspirin. If they're less than four and a half hours, you take them for thrombolysis and you give aspirin the following day. Okay, so that's the, the main distinction. If the patient has AF, you then start anticoagulation two weeks later. You don't give anticoagulation immediately because there is a risk of brain hemorrhage. So you do not give anticoagulation in the immediate phase. Okay, so the last three questions. 
sorry, no, it's still not yet, but the, for the last three questions, the quicker you answer, um, the more points you get. So that'll be from the question after this. Yes, AZ, that's thrombectomy. Okay, so four and a half hours for thrombolysis, and then six hours thrombectomy, you can consider up to 24 hours, but ideally within six hours. Uh, okay, so yes, nice guidance says step three is add Monte Lucas. So step one and two, the initial stages, salbutamol, beclometasone. If that fails, you give Monte Lucas. You do not use ipratropium or tiotropium in asthma. These are anti-muscarinics, and those are, those are typically used in COPD. Or you, they may be used in specialist cases in asthma, but not typically used. You try to avoid increasing your steroid dose until you have to because of the implications of high-dose steroids. And there's only really one dose of salbutamol that you use. So the correct answer is Monte Lucas. And here's the flow chart from our website textbook, so please do check that out. Let's crack on. So the quicker you answer, the more points you get now. Nice little split there. So nephrotic syndrome needs three and a half grams of uromoprotein over 24 hours. That's why option one is incorrect. Patients with nephrotic syndrome are hypercoagulable because they lose antithrombin-3, which normally inhibits the coagulation pathway. If you lose antithrombin-3, you're more prone to forming throm thrombi, essentially. Um, so you become hypercoagulable. Next question. So the, the presentation we put up on our website, for those of you who are asking. Again, the quicker you answer, the more points you get. So what's your management here or what medication would you or wouldn't you give here? split so you don't need to do anything obviously you'll you'll manage the patient's airway you'll put them on their side etc but in terms of medications and all of those options given uh, none of them are correct 
the patient, you only start giving medical management for, uh, for a seizure if it lasts longer than five minutes. And that's known as status epilepticus. Um, if it's less than five minutes, there's a good chance it will just resolve by itself. And this is the treatment of status epilepticus from our textbook. Um, again, the key point is if it's less than five minutes, according to guidance, you don't actually need to do anything. Longer than five minutes, you can start giving lorazepam, et cetera. Um, so that's why the answer is none. But do check out our textbook on that. Final question. This could be the deciding question between first place and fourth place, between that hundred pound prize and just falling short. So the quicker you answer, the more points. Good. So this was a tricky question to end on. Um, don't worry, it's a, a difficult one, so don't worry if you got it wrong. But the point is, this patient has absent bowel sounds and abdominal distension five days post-operatively. So the answer is not going to be bowel adhesions, because that's a long-term thing which causes obstruction, um, you know, kind of several years later. This is an acute cause of, well, acute cause of bowel obstruction or functional bowel obstruction. And the answer here is ileus. That's why this patient has abdominal distension. Ileus is linked with hypokalemia, as well as a number of other causes, such as morphine, um, infection, ischemia. So the answer is hypokalemia, and that's associated with ileus, which is what this patient has. Okay, let's do the leaderboard reveal now. All right. Well done, everyone. Thank you, Shway. That was, uh, hopefully you all found that useful and uh, covered a massive variety of specialties there. And we'll take any questions at the end. But the big reveal of the leaderboard, so the top 10, uh, as we said, and remind you to please take a screenshot or a picture of this. Amazing stuff. Congrats to- Well done, guys our top three, but really congrats to absolutely everyone that took part. Maram, Nabahin, take a bow, fantastic stuff. Thank you to everyone who took part. As we said, please remember to take a screenshot or picture if you are in the top three and email that us over at Bite Medicine, admin at Bite Medicine. I'll put those instructions up here. Again, remember to follow those and I hope you enjoyed our national medical competition or international you know, even I, I wonder where where people i think we have people from all around the world actually and yeah thank you so much for, for tuning in yeah thank you so so much um if you've won a prize congrats if you haven't you know i'm sure you will next time keep working hard um if you could please leave us some feedback i'd be massively grateful as well because we want to improve well. these competitions as well. So I'll, I'll pop the link in the chat as well. Put your questions in the Q&A. And if you're from somewhere from abroad, you can put it in the chat. So we've got someone from UAE. That's very interesting. We've got someone from Switzerland. Very cool. I've been to the UAE. I've not been to Switzerland. So, you know, um, got a very international audience here. Mm. I saw someone saying something about seizures. For the seizure question, what do you do before the five minutes? Uh, well, in real life, you would probably just give the lorazepam, but according to exams and guidelines, you should just wait. You should turn the patient on their side, protect their airway. You can put a nasopharyngeal airway in um, and start them on high flow oxygen to make sure that, you know, because they can lose their airway in seizures. So you just want to make sure their airway and breathing is okay. Um, check their OBS. Once it hits that five minute mark, you can start 
lorazepam if you're in a hospital. If you're outside of hospital, you can give buccal midazolam or rectal diazepam. But again, check um, check our textbook section because it goes into that in a lot of a lot of detail. Yeah, and multiple repeat seizures without <laughs> regaining of consciousness in yeah. between is also important. Exactly. Yeah. If you have multiple seizures without regaining consciousness, that's an indication to start treatment. Uh, lovely. Thank you so much for everyone's kind words. Really appreciate it. Um, do you have any questions? Uh, Shreve, any useful tips and tricks for the Year Five SAQ paper at Cambridge? Uh, so when I when I was there, that was a pathology exam, but I don't know if that's changed now. <clears throat> so it used to be a pathology short answer question paper, and it was really difficult. Um, we had a few past paper questions that I did, and that's the best way. Um, otherwise, the, the best thing is to avoid chunky texts like Robin's pathology, because I think a lot of people would get bogged down for them. Just use something short and sweet, and that, that should be enough to get you through and just practice those past paper questions is what I'd say. But feel free to email me if you have any more specific questions and I can give some advice. Um, can I check from the last question? The abdominal distension is caused by ileus. So ileus, yes, is a functional, it's actually functional bowel obstruction where the bowel has become paralyzed there's no mechanical blockage, but the actual bowel is not peristalsing as it should. So you just get gas building up in the bowel and that causes distension. And that's known as ileus. It typically happens post-operatively and it's linked with hypokalemia. Someone has asked this question again. I have my finals coming up, but don't seem motivated to study. Please advise. Azim, do you want to take that one? You're, you're quite good with motivational tips. Ah, motivation. Um, so, I mean, it's a tough one. And I know I've never had to revise for, for medical school exams in the middle of a pandemic. So first of all, I'll preface this answer by the fact that any motivation you have is phenomenal. And, you know, you've been working through one of the hardest times to revise during modern education so that is a testament to your hard work and in terms of keeping up motivation i guess it's just seeing the larger picture um you have finals coming up i'm not sure if that's when you say finals whether you mean your final exams at medical school or you know final exams in, in that particular year but regardless i guess it's just seeing the overall uh, and the bigger picture you know this short sprint leading up to the exams if you can really buckle down and focus do as, you know, particularly do, doing questions is, is, is how I revise throughout a lot of medical school and trying to really get through as many questions as you can and, and also, you know, supplementing that with textbook work. Really just try and try and set time schedules for what you're going to do in one day and then also over the week and then everything that needs to be covered leading up to the exam. But remember, you're not going to be doing exams every day for the rest of your life. And if you can see that, you know, in by the end of this year or however many years it is, you will be you'll be a doctor or you'll be a PA or whatever you're studying, um, seeing the bigger picture and knowing that exams are not the be all and end all is probably how I would see it. But it is difficult and, you know, chunk and don't, don't try and work eight hours in a row, try and work shorter bursts more than anything else is what I'd advise. Yeah, and I would say like, um, it's quite demotivating right, reading like textbooks and things. And I, I just found that really overwhelming. The best and the funnest way is to participate in quizzes like this, just do questions as many questions as you can, um, you know, watch videos, webinars. It can get really demotivating just sitting there with an open textbook. So that's another way to keep yourself motivated is actually like make sure your study methods are like suited for, for you. Cool. There are there are a lot of questions there. I don't think we'll be able to get through all of them. Um, but if you do have any dying questions, I guess just email email us at admin at biomedicine.com and we'll try and get back to you as soon as as soon as we can. If you did, I'll see a few questions about, you know, coming third place. If you've come in first, second or third, just send us a screenshot. We'll try and get a certificate for third place as well. But unfortunately, beyond that, we just don't have the capabilities to give out masses of certificates, unfortunately. Um, but any other particular questions, pop us an email and we'll try and get back to you.